know, what to work on the religion and faith of Theodore Roosevelt called Preaching from the Bully Pulpit. And he's here, here, here tonight to uh, tell us more about Theodore's changing faith and how he, how he incorporated that faith into his politics. So take it away.
here pictured uh, was a member of the Dutch Reformed Church, and more specifically, the Reformed Church in America, with this tradition. Roosevelt's mother, Martha, was a Presbyterian. And so, growing up, when Theodore was a small child, and he went by the nickname T.D., they attended a Presbyterian church, Madison Square Presbyterian, again in downtown Manhattan. Theodore had an older sister, Anna, who they called Mammy, and then Theodore, and then his younger brother, Elliot, and a younger sister, Corinne. So, four children, two parents, attending Madison Square Presbyterian, with Theodore Sr., really an exemplar of kind of Christian philanthropy, Christian duty uh, for his family and for the city. Because the family business had prospered, Theodore Sr. was able to give a lot of his time to um, charitable activities um, of various kinds. And Theodore Sr. was really a strong influence on his children. As they got older, and as the family um, moved uptown in the 1870s, they also uh, changed their church affiliation. They changed from a Presbyterian church to the congregation pictured here, and sadly this, this building is no longer a church, um, the Collegiate Reformed Church of St. Nicholas. And that went along with that Dutch Reform background that Theodore Sr. had. One of the first really recorded testimonies of Theodore Roosevelt's own faith came when he was uh, 16 years old and wanted to join the church. So in the RCA tradition, he became confirmed in the church, usually as a teenager, and then he could have communion and things like that. So Theodore had to make a kind of profession of faith. This is what we have, and I'll read that and then I'll explain a little bit more maybe why we shouldn't uh, take this word for word. But this is, this is what we have as the sources tell us. This is what he told the minister. I would like to become a member of the church. You know how strictly I have been raised religiously in Christian faith and denominational doctrine, and I feel now as if I ought to unite with the church. I feel the one who believes so firmly in the Bible and in Christianity as I do should say so publicly and enter openly into the active service of the church to drill with the troops and fight in the battlefront with the soldiers of the cross. To join a church now will do me good personally and will be in obedience to the express command of Christ. I want to be a witness for Christ, a doer of the word. Now that's really straightforward, really concrete, really specific. The only problem is that those words come from 45 years after this conversation took place between him and the pastor. The pastor, James Ludlow, was still living when Theodore was about died in 1919, and he was giving this information to an early biographer, T.R., who was recounting this conversation they had in 1874. To my knowledge, there would have been no reason for Ludlow to write down that conversation in 1874 because Theodore was nobody important in 1874. So even if we allow, for some taking this with a grain of salt, that it's the memory of almost a half century earlier, if it communicates the of that conversation, we can still see a few things. We see that military imagery that was uh, to be associated with TR for the rest of his life, drilling with the troops, fighting in the battlefront. Then we see that last line, to be a witness for Christ, a doer of the word. And that phrase, doer of the word, comes from the book of James. Where we're told to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of it. And that was one of Roosevelt's favorite verses as an adult and really a key part of his philosophy. That Christianity was really mostly about doing good works and that theology or dogma or the intellectual parts of faith were a far distant second. I'll flesh that out a little bit more later. So this is what we have from him as a, a teenager. Two years later, he went off to Harvard College for his education. And a few things happened to him during his time at Harvard that would shape him for rest of his life. And just as a parenthesis, if you want to see the actual physical papers of Theodore Roosevelt have been preserved, they're in the Harvard archives at Putnam Library. So I was able to go there a few years earlier, spend a few days truly holding <laughs> the papers that he held um, in my hands. Um, be careful not to, you know, have my elbows off the table or have pages hanging off and I yelled at a few times for offenses like that from the librarians. So you be careful with the documents. But Harvard holds his papers, and that's largely due to the family relationship with Harvard as he 
was part of the class of 1880. One of the key things that happened to him during his time at Harvard was that in February of 1878, his beloved father, Theodore Sr., passed away. Not exactly without any forewarning, because he had been sick, but relatively suddenly. He had been healthy, had developed uh, intestinal cancer, and then passed away within a month or two of developing that. And it was made the worse for Theodore because his family didn't want to bother him bad news about his father, so they kept that information from him and only sent for him at the last minute when his father was really on his deathbed. So like anyone having to process the death of someone very close to them, uh, Theodore grieved substantially during his time at Harvard, and we know about this because he was keeping a diary on a fairly regular basis. And that diary reflects everything from his social life to the girls he was interested in to the classes that he was taking. Um, but then a lot of it at this time has to do with his death, and we can see the way he was processing that. A lot of that dealt with his own faith. So let me just give you a few examples of the way that we can see how religion and his own faith is influencing the way he was grieving. So a few entries. June 30, 1878. Nothing but my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ could have carried me through this, my terrible time of trial and sorrow. That's a significant entry because that's one of the very few times in Roosevelt's writings where he mentions Jesus Christ specifically. He's a lot bigger on God or, you know, kind of a, I won't say deism, but almost the founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, like invocation of a first cause or the great governor of the universe, things like that. But this is a specific reference to Jesus Christ. March 6, 1878. I think I can really and honestly say, Thy will be done. And here he is quoting Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus' crucifixion, when he's surrendering to his Father's will. April 21st, 1878. It is lovely to think of us meeting in heaven, and how we shall be united with the dear one who has gone before. So there's a real belief in heaven, there's a hope that he'll be reunited with his beloved Father in the afterlife, and there's many other examples of him copying stanzas from hymns, going over certain scripture passages that were meaningful to his father, and really grieving in a way that was in keeping with the Christian tradition in which he was raised. So that was tough in his early years at Harvard. The more positive part came during his junior and senior year when he met and began to court Alice Hathaway Lee. Alice was not a Harvard student. Harvard would be admitting women for a long time to come after that. But she was a local girl and friends of friends. Um, and Roosevelt began to see her on a regular basis. And it took a little persuading on his part to get her to be interested in him. It wasn't quite a mutual attraction at the beginning. But he was able to um, win her heart eventually. And they would be married a few months after his graduation on his birthday in October 1880. They were happily married for a number of years. Roosevelt's political career began as he was elected to the New York uh, Assembly. He was an assemblyman from a silk stocking kind of district in Manhattan. And then Alice became pregnant. And their living arrangements were a little complicated because he was in Albany carrying out his duties as an assemblyman. She lived there for a while and she was back in New York City under the care of relatives. But she gave birth to a baby girl in February. And Roosevelt got congratulatory messages and telegrams, and then he got another telegram that told him he needed to come home immediately. And it took him five hours to be a train because it was very foggy on the night that he was coming from Albany back to Manhattan. Um, but when he arrived, his brother Elliot told him that Alice, his wife, was dying and that their mother was dying too in the same house. And these were not connected. Different diseases were taking um, each of them, as his mother and his wife. But within a day, within 24 hours, uh, both his wife and his mother died in the same house on the same day. And this was a, a tragedy that was shaken to his core, as it would anyone who had to experience something like that. He was uh, 25 years old. He had not been writing as consistently in that diary once he was elected to his office, but he took up his pen February 14th, 1884, and you can see the reproduction here of what he wrote. Some have seen a cross in that first mark, this is where Tennessee X 
And in that one haunting sentence, the light is going out of my mouth. And he would grieve uh, for Alice in his own way over the coming years. But the interesting contrast with this grief as compared to the one for his father was that religion seemed to play almost no role before. At least not in the recorded sources. And that's an important topic because historians can only deal with the sources that we have. I don't have access to his mind. I don't have access to his thoughts or anything that might have been destroyed or not preserved and things like that. But from the written record, which is pretty rich for the 19th century, he does not seem to have grieved in a way uh, that he did for his father. And I say in the book that when Theodore Sr. died, Roosevelt went to the Bible for comfort. In 1884, he went to the West. And this would be his way of healing and recovery. A few years before, Roosevelt had used a good bit of his family income and inheritance to purchase uh, two ranches in the Dakota Territory. These were not yet the states of North and South Dakota. It was an organized territory just called Dakota. And he spent $80,000 in like 1880 money to purchase these two ranches. Again, it gives you a sense of the wealth of that family. That's something I think we don't always pick up on as we're looking back at Roosevelt's extraordinary wealth of this family. So he had these two ranches, he had these properties, and he decided after Alice's death he was going to go west. His little girl, also named Alice, um, will be left to the care of her aunt, Fanny, to T.R. sister. And contrary to popular belief, he never lived full time in the Dakota, ter Dakota Territory on these ranches. He was constantly going back and forth between Dakota and New York City. But he did spend substantial amounts of time on his ranches. We think of him as a cowboy. He thought of himself as a ranchman. And there was a difference. Cowboys worked for ranchmen. Ranchmen owned the property. Now, that's not to say he didn't do his share of the work. He did. He spent many hours in the saddle. He participated in finding lost cattle. He you know, fought uh, outlaws who were in the territory, things of that nature. But there was a distinction between him as the owner and those who he hired him for. And Roosevelt was a great writer. We get an underappreciated aspect of him, probably. We think of him sometimes as the, the cowboy, but he was also an intellectual and a writer. He wrote in his some of the council this time in 1888. Interesting phrase that helps us understand that grief. He wrote that black care rarely sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. Black care rarely sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. Meaning you've got to keep moving, you stay busy, you stay energized, and you leave depression behind you. That was his way of dealing with grief, it seems, at this point. Again, in contrast to going to a church, reading the Bible, praying, things of that nature. And then, in 1886, or 85, 86, another woman came into his life, Edith Carroll Roosevelt. They had known each other as kids, as teenagers. They had actually been sort of boyfriend and girlfriend when they were teenagers growing up together in New York City and Long Island before he went to Harvard. They had quarreled. They did not tell us what the quarrel was about. They broke up. They went their separate ways, to went to Harvard, but he accidentally ran into Edith on one of his trips back to New York City in, I think, 1885. And they began their friendship anew. They began seeing each other secretly. He would just write E in his diary to keep it a secret because it went against conventions to remarry, especially this quick in the 19th century, especially for those of that upper crust society, and Roosevelt had very conflicted feelings about his relationship with Edith. He was concerned that he was somehow betraying his love for Alice, and betraying Alice's memory if he went married to someone else. But he did that anyway. They got engaged secretly. Somehow the New York Times found out about it, printed it, um, became public knowledge, um, and T.R. writing in a rather embarrassed fashion back to his family. In 1886, is writing, Were I sure there were a heaven, my one prayer would be I might never go there. Because he's embarrassed of meeting Alice again. That he, again, he feels like he's betrayed that love and that memory. So that's interesting. But for the religious side, it's also interesting that he uses this phrase, Were I sure there were a heaven. Meaning, something's changed between when Theodore Sr. died and I'm looking forward to seeing him again, and now in 1886, I'm not sure that heaven even exists. So there's an evolution there. There's a change. TR's faith in these years. 
His career, of course, goes on. His ranches don't amount to much. There's a terrible blizzard in the winter of 1887. He loses um, at least, I think, half his investment, and then he has to sell what's left, and he's not really going back to Dakota to be a ranch man. But he comes back to New York City, and he tries to get his political career going. Runs for mayor in 1886, comes in third place in a freeway contest, but he was kind of being a good soldier for the Republican Party. He writes some books, he writes some histories, some biographies. Um, Governor Morris, an early Federalist, Federalist leader, um, Thomas Hart Benton, uh, senator, um, pre-Civil War era, to bring in income. But he doesn't really get his next kind of full-time or permanent job until 1889, when he becomes a civil service commissioner. Frankly, this is not the most exciting part of TR's life, so you should go through this part pretty quickly. But just so you know, uh, late 1880s, early 1890s, there's this move to clean up the spoils system in American politics. The old system is, you work for me, I get elected, I make you deputy street cleaning commissioner or assistant postmaster or something like that, even though you don't have any qualifications. The civil service, which of course you still have with us today, is supposed to have qualified people in these public kinds of jobs. And TR's job as civil service commissioner is to see that the law is enforced. And it gave him opportunities for lots of battles for righteousness, for morality. Those were important words to him, especially righteousness. And it's a key feature of his political career going forward. Aggressive fighting for the right is the noblest sport the world affords. Okay, that epitomizes his attitude. He, at least in his own mind, is always on the side of right. Those who oppose him are always on the side of wrong. And his family is now growing in these years. He's going to be civil service commissioner until 1895. And so we have, um, in this picture on the left, T.R. and Edith. In the back, daughter Alice, who has long since come back to live in the family. Next to her, their son, Ted. And then in the front, Archie, Kermit, and Ethel. One more child is to be born. So he's living in Washington, D.C. He's a civil service commissioner all through the early 1890s. And then in 1895, he goes back to New York City and becomes a police commissioner instead. Never a policeman, he had no background in law enforcement, and a little ironically, for civil service commissioner, he gets appointed to this position anyway. And it's his job to try to clean up corruption, which there's a lot of in the New York City police force. One of the ways he does this is through his famous midnight rambles through the city, where he would wait till 12, midnight, 1 a.m., and then he would walk through the streets of New York City, taking reporters with him. He would look for policemen who were sleeping, drunk, on break when they were supposed to be, things like that. And he gained this reputation, as the New York Times was a couple this kind of thing. He gained this reputation for one who would set things right, who would clean up the corruption, who would bring order to the police department. And so it makes for great copy. His fame is starting to rise, and he gets this reputation to get as kind of a reformer. He also had the policy of appointing the best people for the jobs in the NYPD, regardless of religious affiliation, at a time when he had to be careful that Protestants, Catholics, and Jews all felt that their interests were not being neglected. Roosevelt said, I don't care if this person's a Catholic, I don't care if he's a Protestant, if the you know, most qualified person is a Jew, the Jewish person will be appointed with a Catholic or the Protestant or whatever. So he's trying to bring equality He's trying to bring reform to New York City Police Department. Then, a few more steps in his career before he becomes president. With the election of the Republican William McKinley in 1896, there was an opportunity for him to go back into the federal service. And he got himself appointed Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897. That would be important because one year later, the Spanish-American War would break out. Now at this point, Roosevelt is 39 years old. He has a wife, six children, but he's been an advocate of war with Spain. He's done a little bit to bring it about through his naval maneuvers, and he decides that his duty compels him to resign. His position as Assistant Secretary of the Navy and volunteer for action himself. And so again, because of who he is and his connections, he gets a commission to round up and recruit a regiment that would become known as Roosevelt Rough Riders. And there's a lot of mythology surrounding the Rough Riders, but a lot of it has a basis in fact that 
They included people on the run from the law. They included police officers. They included the best polo player in the Northeast. There were Harvard men. There were people who probably not been in high school. But Roosevelt was able to kind of form them all into one group and very much celebrated as a kind of a cross section of American life. And so he becomes Lieutenant Colonel Roosevelt, promoted to Colonel Roosevelt. He really does lead a charge up San Juan Hill in July of 1898. And is that what John Hay called the splendid little war. The United States was able to quickly defeat Spain and help Roosevelt start a rise in the war as a national figure when he returns home for more triumphant. His next step is to become governor of New York. The Republicans actually held the governorship of New York in 1898, but the incumbent governor was under suspicion for corruption, things of that nature, so he needed someone else. Roosevelt, the war hero, was the perfect substitute for that, and he gets himself elected governor of New York. It actually didn't take up all his time. He found time during one of his summers to write another historical book while he was governor. This was a biography of the Puritan leader Oliver Cromwell. So if you can think back to the 17th century, to the English Civil War, if this rings any bells for you, Oliver Cromwell will be the Puritan leader coming out of the English Civil War before the restoration of the monarchy. And Oliver Cromwell is significant for us, interested in Roosevelt's religious life, because he was this Puritan leader. And so Oliver Cromwell is actually less interesting for what Roosevelt has to say about Cromwell in particular. It's more interesting for what he has to say about Puritanism than religion. And it tells us probably more about tea than it really tells us about Cromwell. But two important quotes from this book to help us understand where Roosevelt is in his own development and his own theology and thinking about the role of Christianity in public life. Roosevelt wrote, it was also the era in the 17th century in which the old theological theory of the all-importance of dogma came into sharp conflict with the now healthy general religious belief in the superior importance of conduct. Conduct is more important than dogma. Deeds, not creeds. We might say that today. That's essentially Roosevelt's philosophy. Because, in the second quote, there are hundreds of different creeds, or shades of creeds, all of which are believed in with equal devoutness by their followers. So who's to say who's right and who's wrong? He kind of gives up on that. Therefore, in a workaday government, it is necessary to insist that none shall interfere with any other. What you believe about the Trinity, what you believe about transubstantiation, what you believe about predestination or the second coming of Christ, or any other number of divisive theological doctrines, Roosevelt would say, really doesn't matter as long as you're doing good deeds, being a good citizen, and adding to the health and morality of the community. And the government's role is not to discriminate. The government's role is to treat, in his day, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew all equally. So we're beginning to see the picture of the mature Roosevelt's beliefs. In 1900, he's not gotten along very well with the New York bosses and the Republican Party. They're looking to get rid of him. William McKinley's vice president has died. There's an opening to be vice president. He's not all that excited about that. But he'll go along with the party. McKinley's re-elected in 1900. Roosevelt is vice president. Nobody expects him to really do much after that, but for McKinley's assassination in September 1901. And Roosevelt becomes the youngest person to that point. Um, who's now the President of the United States. So transitioning into the second half of things here as we look at a few episodes of Roosevelt's presidency. This is now his family in the White House days. Again, everybody's sort of grown up a little bit, and we've added his um, last son, Clinton, the youngest. The church pictured here is Grace Reformed Church in Washington, D.C. Roosevelt attended a lot of different churches throughout his life, but he tended to prefer liturgical Protestant churches. So the Presbyterian Church of his youth, the Dutch Reformed Church of his teenage years, Washington, D.C. had no Dutch Reformed Church, so he had to settle for a German Reformed Church, which is the one um, pictured here. And then Edith, his wife, his second wife, was in Episcopalian. And so they went to the Episcopal Church a lot, too, in Long Island, and their home at Oyster Bay, Christ Episcopal. But interestingly, again, for all his ecumenism, for all his belief that denominations didn't matter too much, in D.C., Edith took the children from the Episcopal Church, and he went by himself to the Reformed Church. 
Unless there was a child who was misbehaving, then that child had to go along with him to the Reformed Church to be, have a closer eye. So that's the picture at the beginning of his presidency. Three episodes worth talking about here to illustrate that broad-mindedness and that ecumenism that characterized his outlook. The first is that in 1906, Roosevelt appointed the first Jew to a cabinet-level position when he named Oscar Strauss on the left as Secretary of Labor and Commerce. And Roosevelt did this at an interesting time in American history and world history. By the turn of the 20th century, um, Jews around, uh, especially Eastern Europe, uh, especially in Russia, were suffering those um, pogroms where there would be terrible atrocities committed against them, much of the wave of Eastern European and Russian immigration to the United States in that period was Jewish immigration, trying to come to a land of freedom in contrast to the oppression that they were facing. The United States was not perfect by any means when it came to anti-Semitism, but it was certainly a lot less plentiful in the United States than it was in Russia. Roosevelt was not entirely free from anti-Semitism either. In his private writings, you can see some slurs that are directed at Jews. I won't quote those, but they are there. But he was not a rabid anti-Semite. And in this letter to a Protestant pastor, Lyman Abbott, Roosevelt said, I like what I can to appoint a Jew, to give Jews an equal chance in America, and, this is part of the other rationale, to show that because Jews are given an equal chance in America, socialism, communism, anarchism are not necessary solutions, that we will be treated equally. So Roosevelt makes an important move for a marginalized group when he appoints Oscar Strauss to the cabinet. Second group, very different. Um, pictured here is Reed Smoot, who was a United States senator, which is not the issue, but also a Mormon apostle, which was. So to understand that, we have to think about 19th century history, the origin of the Church of Latter-day Saints and the persecution that they faced in America, culminating in the exodus to Utah um, in the pre-Civil War days under Brigham Young. The Mormons were hated for a variety of reasons, but the greatest was that they practiced polygamy. And to a Protestant majority in the United States, Mormons were not legitimate Christians, and the practice of polygamy was barbarous and outdated, and it was a real stumbling block to Utah even being admitted as a state. But once it was, Utah, the citizens of Utah were entitled to, through the legislature, elect their senators. But they chose a Mormon apostle, which would be something like choosing a Catholic bishop to be a senator. It was uh, seen to be a violation of the traditional separation of church and state, and especially because it was a Mormon, it was a real issue. The Senate actually held hearings on and off for years about whether Reed Smoot was entitled to his seat in the Senate. And Roosevelt was not outspoken in favor of Smoot, but as those hearings went on, as he got to know Smoot, as he found he was a faithful Republican, as he found that Smoot himself was not a polygamist, Roosevelt quietly lent his support to Reed Smoot. And later on, looking back at this affair in 1911, Roosevelt could write, if Mr. Smoot had obeyed the law, it would be an outrage to turn him out because of his religious but again, theories, denominations, theology doesn't matter. What matters is someone's conduct, their deeds, their works. And indeed, Reed Smoot would serve in the Senate all the way to the 1930s. Then the last episode, from the end of Roosevelt's presidency, concerned his friend and ultimate successor, William Howard Taft. Taft was not a Jew, Taft was not a Mormon, he was part of older American tradition, he was a Unitarian. And Unitarians were controversial because they did not believe that Jesus Christ is divine, the Holy Spirit is really God, there's only one God, and that's God, 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 God. Jesus Christ was a good teacher, a moral exemplar, okay, but he's not God. And the Unitarians go back, especially in New England into the colonial days, um, but this was controversial when Taft became a national and there were Protestants, especially evangelical type Protestants, who thought it an outrage that in the United States someone could be elected president who didn't believe that Jesus Christ was divine. And this writer, who's actually just a piano salesman in Dayton, Ohio, J.C. Martin, had written a letter, one of many, from people to Taft, asking Taft to explain his beliefs. 
basically justify the fact that he was a Unitarian. And Roosevelt, in the run-up to the election, coached Taft on how to respond. And he told Taft not to go into specifics about his beliefs, but instead to invoke Jefferson and Lincoln, neither of whom were really in the Orthodox Christian category, both of whom regarded as great presidents, and to appeal to them and to appeal to American traditions that what a person believes is between himself and God, and that we don't have religious tests for office in this country. And so the storm passed, Taft was elected, but after the election, Roosevelt responded to this poor Mr. Martin in a widely published open letter, about three pages, excoriating Martin for having the audacity to ask a political candidate to explain his religious beliefs. The task police are purely his own private concern. It is a matter between him and his maker. It's un-American to ask a candidate to have to justify his church background or lack thereof. So three very different cases, three very different circumstances, but all illustrating Roosevelt's depending on your perspective, <laughs> why open-minded theology or just didn't care at all about what anybody actually believed. Something else we think about with Roosevelt and his work as president is his work with conservation. And this is probably one of the most beloved aspects of Roosevelt's legacy. And his work with conservation and the environment is also a window into his beliefs and his spirituality. Roosevelt's nature writings are very spiritual, if you get into them. I've got two quotations here as examples, and I'm hardly the first person to observe that. But as you look at this, you really see religious connections to what he's experiencing in nature and what he's experiencing in a church setting. So all the way back in 1887, he's not even 30 years old yet, he's talking about an experience to a cathedral in Italy, and that cathedral, he says, really awes him. It gives me a feeling I've never had elsewhere except among very wild chasm red mountains or in the vast pine forests. Where then is president? He's talking about a trip, I think it's to Yosemite. The first night was clear and we lay in the open on beds of soft fir boughs among the huge cinnamon-colored trunks of the sequoias. It was like lying in a great solemn cathedral, far vaster and more beautiful than any built by the hand. Just a nightfall I heard among other birds, thrushes, which I think were Rocky Mountain Hermits, the appropriate choir for such a place of worship. So Roosevelt always had this interesting relationship with nature, where nature is part of that healing process. Think of him going to the West, the Badlands, um, in the 1880s to heal from Alice's death. As president, he would escape into nature sometime with these um, hunting trips or even kind of camping trips. Um, he would go on with people like John Muir, York. And nature was a very spiritual place for him. And that's in keeping with Christian theology. It sees the book of nature as one of God's revelations to human beings. And I think Roosevelt experienced that. So even in his conservation, there's a religious tint to what he's doing. Well, we come then to the last 10 years or so of his life, his post-presidential career, which is probably just as exciting as anything that had happened to him before that time. After Taft was elected, Roosevelt wanted to give Taft some space, and again, he loved the outdoors and nature, and so he went on a safari to East Africa. And he would spend the next 18 months or so out in the country, in East Africa, hunting big game, and then working his way up the Nile um, to Cairo University, where he gave a, a speech to the students, and then to Europe, where he toured, uh, going west through Europe, stopping at various places, receiving a Nobel Prize along Japanese War in 1905. Okay. Suzanne Nature is doing this. Part of what he's also doing is encountering missionaries. And he's writing about missionaries. And Roosevelt had a very positive view of Christian missionaries in a place like Africa. Just a little bit because they were helping to save souls, a little bit more because they were boosting uh, Western imperial enterprise, and even more than that, because they were instilling good morals and good habits in the native Africans they were encountering, or so he believed. And Roosevelt was actually invited to a missionary conference in Edinburgh in 1910. This was known as a landmark world missionary conference that was a really ecumenical endeavor across the Protestant spectrum. Um, it was kind of historic in its own right. Roosevelt was asked to be the representative for the Reformed Church in America. He wasn't able to go because of his commitments elsewhere in the world at that time, but he sent a message 
And this is part of that message he sent to that conference. In missionary work, it is imperative to remember that a divided Christendom can only imperfectly bear witness to the essential unity of Christianity. I believe that without compromise of belief, without loss of the positive good contained in the recognition of diversities of gifts, the Christian churches may yet find a way to cordial cooperation. So again, keep your denominations, but work together, keep the main things the main things that we say. Well, he returns to America in 1910. He is not happy with William Howard Taft and the direction that Taft has taken the presidency, which reasons I will go into right now for that. But ultimately, he decides in 1912 that he's going to challenge Taft for the Republican nomination for the presidency. And this is probably not quite unprecedented, but almost, that he would challenge a sitting member of your party for the nomination. And so the candidates go to Chicago to the convention, they battle it out. According to Roosevelt's version of the story, the Republican Party cheats and gives all the disputed delegates to Taft. Taft wins the convention, Roosevelt storms out and announces his intention to create an alternative third party, the Progressive Party or the Blues Party. And they come back to Chicago a few weeks later to have a convention. It must have been a very deja vu kind of feeling for his disciples coming back to the same place to try to have this third party candidacy. And Roosevelt, in the climax to his speeches in both of those conventions, utters one of his most famous lines in the line of biblical imagery. We stand in Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. This did not come out of nowhere. This came out of a lifelong engagement with the King James Bible. This came out of a lifelong church-going habit and at least awareness of the Protestant theologies and Protestant churches, even if they were more or less, you know, who's committed to them or not. But this is apocalyptic now. This is a quote from the book of Revelation about the last battle between Christ and Satan and his wars. So this is a this is a way to up the ante, right, in these political elections, that, again, God's on my side, the devil's on their side. We stand in Armageddon, and we battle for the Lord, and the whole progressive campaign had this kind of religious tint to it. It may be symbolized in this brochure that was created, Progressive Battle Hymns, in which you found traditional hymns like Near My God to Thee, or the Doxology, as well as Honor Christian Soldiers, those hymns that have blended the sacred and secular, and then the hymn to Roosevelt was in there along with them. So this took on a very kind of religious cast and color. He might have had a chance, although probably not too much of one, but events in October would unsettle any chance that he did have. In Milwaukee, Roosevelt was shot by an assassin as he was getting out of his car. And he kind of moved his tongue around in his mouth to see if he felt blood. He did not feel blood. He concluded that his lungs had not been punctured and that therefore he could give the speech that he was intending to give anyway. And so he goes into the auditorium at Milwaukee and he asks for quiet. And he says, I don't know if all of you realize I've just been shot. And people aren't really sure if they believe him or not. So he opens his coat. We see the blood, <laughs> you know, going out on his shirt. Uh, he seems to realize the full extent of his injuries. Thankfully, he had a 60 page speech that was folded over his heart to slow the, the bullet there. But he proceeds to speak anyway. For about 45 minutes, he's throwing the pages down on the ground as he's speaking. He stops, he seems a little wobbly. He says, well, I can just go on a short time more. Half an hour later, he's off the stage finally and submits to this treatment. So he finally goes to the hospital. This is the x-ray of the bullet that entered him inches from his heart. Um, it would stay in him the rest of his life. The doctors thought it was too risky to extract it, but his injuries really forestalled any chance that he might have had to make a last ditch effort at winning the presidency, and so that fell to Woodrow Wilson. His last great adventure was one more international trip to South America, where he was initially going to give a series of lectures. That turned into a naturalistic expedition to categorize and find flora and fauna in South America, and that turned into a really foolish decision to explore an unknown it was not what he had come for. It was not what he had prepared for. But given the opportunity, he wasn't going to say no. As he would later recall, this is my last chance to be a boy. And so he and his party explored the river of doubt and almost killed him. Uh, he contracted malaria. He had a cut in his leg. He developed an infection. He lost something like 55 pounds on this experience. He 
you want to read more about it, I recommend Candace Miller's River of Doubt. Um, I know at least one of you in here has, has read that. Um, it's a great story, um, but it's a harrowing ordeal for someone who's now in his 50s. The religious significance here will be that the trip was partially planned by the person on the far left of the photograph on the left, Father John Zahn, who is a Catholic priest at Notre Dame. At a time when Catholics were still in the margins of American life, and Catholic priests especially so, they were widely disregarded and distrusted by the Protestant majority. But Zahn had some similar beliefs to Roosevelt. Zahn had supported Roosevelt in 1912, many of his friends had not. And so Roosevelt and Zahn cooperated and were photographed together on this trip down the river. Now, Zahn didn't make it all the way because he insisted on being carried in a sedan chair by some of the native uh, Indians in Brazil, which did not go over well with them or with Roosevelt, and he was sent back to before they went back to the river. But he did help plan it, and he was an associate of TR. And TR was fairly nice to him in his memoirs. He just said, Father Zahn departed us. Not that I kicked out Zahn and sent him back to America. So it's a Harry Moore deal, but it is successful. He's going to go and make this presentation to the Royal Geographical Society in London about this river that they put on the map. He's coming back 1914, a few weeks later, World War I erupts. This is kind of the last major episode of his life. Roosevelt's an early advocate of the Allies and of the United States doing more to help the Allies of Britain and France and against Germany and their associates. And he's a very strong critic of Woodrow Wilson, who he sees as not being aggressive enough in going after the Germans. And in four books that are a compilation of his writings, 1914-1918, we see biblical themes hammered over and over again in why the United States should be involved in this war. And he invokes relatively obscure passages, like the Curse of Miraz from Judges chapter 5. And just in case you didn't read Judges chapter 5, it's the curse of your eyes is about those who did not come to the aid of the Lord when they were supposed to, but who hung back in the day of trouble. And Roosevelt's comparing Wilson and those who are not advocating preparedness as being under the curse of your eyes. It's one 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 example of it. Once we're in the war in 1917, he goes half in hand to Wilson and asks for permission to raise another Rough Riders kind of division with himself at the head. Wilson is not going to have any of that. I mean, Roosevelt is not in the kind of shape to do. Anything like that, he's hardly going to hand a political victory to someone like T.R. anyway. So he didn't get to go, but um, his sons did. All, all four of his sons served in World War I. And the youngest, Clinton, uh, was a pilot and paid the ultimate price in July 1918 when he was shot down in North France. And Clinton's death, I think, really sobered T.R. It did not, again, contrary to what someone said, it did not make him repent for his enthusiasm for World War I, but it did help him see the human cost, I think, and maybe the reality um, that war in 1918 was not the war of 1898. And nobody was charging up on Calvary in 1918 the way that they had been in 1898. The, the world of poison gas and machine guns and aerial warfare was quite a different world from the military experience that he had. And then Roosevelt himself would die in January 1919. He had a lot of health problems in the last year, years of his life. It's hard to know exactly Cost is that the probably some kind of part of it. So I think I'm definitely at the end of my time here. Let me summarize the four themes that I've seen through Roosevelt's life. I really can't answer the question was he a Christian? Did he believe a specific thing or not? Because so many times he just doesn't tell us. But these are the things that I would say are my contributions to that conversation we sort of begin with, with all those different opinions from writers like this. I see first Roosevelt as a religious pilgrim who moved from Orthodox faith, maybe even evangelical faith, as a young person, seen especially in his grieving and death of his father, to a more mainline Christian, still a churchgoer, still a quoter of the Bible, still respectful of all kinds of faith, but not very excited about any particular theology. Second, Roosevelt is a bully pulpit preacher who used the language of the King James Bible to uh, exhort his fellow citizens to good works. And that took the political realm, his political messages over and over, filled with those themes of righteousness. Third, Roosevelt is a religious ecumenist who didn't really matter what you believed as long as you were doing good works. And then lastly, and probably the theme I highlighted the least in this particular lecture, Roosevelt is a champion of the separation of church and state. 
a constant opponent of government funds, especially for Catholic schools, but really for any kind of sectarian purpose. That church and state must be separate. That's the American tradition. And no, you can't ask Catholic about what he believes because that's not our way. So I'm happy to take any questions. Again, this is uh, based on this book that I've read. This is not supposed to be an extended commercial for the book, but this is kind of what this is based off of. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to.